So it's Friday, so it's time for poets. Some of us know that as push off early tomorrow's Saturday, but in this context, it's the perioperative enhancement team. Inspired by Dr. Sol Aronson and the team at Duke, a selection of clips to get us thinking about the next steps in providing world-class perioperative care. You'll find the full lectures in our back catalogue, or join us at the upcoming perioperative practicum for expert discussions, business case tips, and hands-on workshops. Go to www.ebpom.org and look for our international programme of perioperative practicums. Top Med Talk. Welcome back to Top Med Talk at EBPOM 2018. We are celebrating 20 years of evidence-based perioperative medicine this year. I am your host, Desiree Chapel, and this afternoon I'm joined by two very special guests from the conference, uh, Ramani Moonseeker. She is the professor of perioperative medicine at University College of London, and Anne-Marie Bougeard. She is a perioperative medicine fellow at the Royal College of Anesthetists, and she is also an anesthetic trainee in Devon. Ladies, thank you so much for sitting down and joining me this afternoon. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Good. All right, I'll give you guys a chance to give a little bit about about your background um, here in just a moment, but... Uh, I wanted to start off with you, Anne-Marie, and tell us a little bit about what TRIPOM is, what that stands for, and what you're doing in that right now. So, Okay, thank you. Um, so TRIPOM stands for Trainees with an Interest in Perioperative Medicine, and um, it was set up, uh, coming up for three years ago now, um, by Sam Bampo and John Whittle, who I think you'll hear from later. Um, and the idea is that it's a collaboration of um, trainees across the specialties involved in perioperative medicine um, to provide the opportunity to share experience, share training, knowledge um, and educational resources as its primary objective. Um, and it's really grown quite uh, massively over the last couple of years and um, uh, has representation from across the specialties, particularly strongly in anesthesia um, and in geriatrics. And we also have surgical representation at trainee level. Um, And that's been really nice in terms of um, shaping the way trainees are coming through um, to provide care across the pathway and um, provide a forum to talk to each other about the issues that are faced um, both during training, um, on the job, and um, looking towards job planning for when they become consultants themselves. Yeah. Much like Ramini. <laughs> so, Ramini, give us a little bit about your background and uh, talk to us about being a professor of perioperative medicine. <laughs> well, I can't tell you that much about that because I'm, I'm just starting. But I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my background. So, um, I trained in medicine first and then uh, critical care and anesthesia. I became a consultant in 2010. And um, I came to research, which is my other sort of main non-clinical interest, uh, really quite late in my career. So, towards the end of my training... I did an MD under the supervision of Mike Brocott and um, really, really enjoyed it and then sort of set myself the goal of trying to find time and and therefore funding to do research um, uh, more as part of my day-to-day job. And so I've ended up now in a situation where I'm uh, actually a non-theatres perioptimist. So my um, my research work is around um, health services research into perioptive care, so looking at what uh, benefits patients and also how we work in systems to improve patient care. Um, but my clinical work is, is around um, preoptive assessment and postoperative care. So I've done critical care for many years, but I'm actually going to stop doing that now. Um, but I'm not going to return to the anaesthetic room, at least not, not for a little while. So... I hope that that demonstrates that actually the role of the perioptive clinician can be really quite varied. And as Amory's already uh, intimated, you know, perioptive physicians are coming from a range of different clinical backgrounds, geriatrics, critical care, anesthesiology, and so on and so forth. Um, And I think we really need to embrace that um, because we can all bring different skills to the to the, to the fold. Yeah, for sure. How how has it been transitioning, I guess, into this space and sharing it with these other providers? How is that working? So again, you know, still very much learning. Um, I've always done preoperative assessments and postoperative care in some way, shape, or form mm-hmm. because I've done clinics and I've done critical care. Um, but the opportunity to use um, a real standard of care, which is acute pain postoperative ward rounds. Um, as an opportunity to broaden out into perioperative care is a really, really fantastic one that my hospital has given me the opportunity to to do. So um, I think uh, sharing the space with other colleagues is straightforward on the whole. Um, 
we sadly don't have enough, for example, geriatricians in this country to meet the need that there is to provide yeah. um, specialist high-quality care to surgical patients of that age. Um, so actually there's a real imperative for us to get involved in uh, the care of the older patients undergo undergoing major surgery. And similarly, if you talk to most surgeons, most surgeons in my experience anyway, um, they're relieved to have the support of a multidisciplinary team to try and yeah. improve care of their patients. Um, they're the absolute experts in the operating theatre, but outside the operating theatre, we all acknowledge that we have a lot of different strengths to bring to patient care that should come from anaesthetists, surgeons, nurses, doctors, geriatricians, you know, a wide variety of people. Yeah, we actually had a great conversation with um, Jugdeep. Yeah. Yes, about um, the geriatrician's role in this and what they're doing up at her facility uh, to try and with POPs and some of those other um, other initiatives yeah. to get that that group involved. And of course, care. we use age as a convenient threshold yeah. for thinking about high-risk patients, but it isn't the only one. Right. There are plenty of at-risk younger patients. Oh, yeah. Um, so actually that again is a real opportunity for anaesthetists and other physicians who want to get involved in um, perioptive medicine yeah. um, to, to be able to acknowledge that and understand that. Yeah. Emery, what's your experience been so far um, within the program? Um, well, it's been really fascinating. Um, and I think and I'm preparing a talk for later in the meeting, but um, I've been really privileged to, to work um, at the college um, in helping to deliver the program for the last year and a half. And I sort of had a list of objectives of things I thought I might learn, um, which I have done. Um, but some of the, the things I've learnt and the, um, the understanding I have are, are things that I wouldn't have ever imagined, really. And I think one of the... Uh, so collaboration is, is probably one of the most important. And I, and I think that gets bandied around quite a lot, collaboration. But actually, it, it is doing things like going and talking to your colleagues and understanding what they do and what their challenges are um, um, both at sort of the cold phase level when you're in clinical medicine um, and, and expanding that and talking to your more senior colleagues at a, um, at a collegiate level and at a at, um, policy level to try and tease out well how, how can you develop a program that answers some of those questions and um, one of the other things I've, I've learned is the um, is the role of the external influences on what we are trying to achieve. So um, I think uh, we've reasonably convinced the anaesthetic community that perioperative medicine is what we need to be doing. Um, but sometimes it can feel like you're in an echo chamber. And um, part of the role I've had at the college has been to see how external influences impact on what we're trying to do. And we can shout about uh, anemia pathways till the cows come home. But unless we understand what else is happening in the world of healthcare and, um, and government policy, then um, we're really rate limited by that. So um, some of the people we've been working with have um, given us really good insights into how um, surveying the, the much wider scene, both in the media and, um, and uh, general commentary, um, impact on, um, on how, we, how we want to deliver um, the pathway changes and the and quality improvement changes that we are aiming for. Um, and that's probably been something I was aware of, but not to anywhere near the, the degree that, um, that uh, I have done. And i give you one example is um, getting it right first time, mm -hmm. which I was aware of and had just published when I started this position. But it's gained huge traction in the last couple of years. Um, and actually, um, because of its, uh, its role and where it sits um, uh, in the wider healthcare setting, some of the things we're trying to do are going to piggyback onto GERFT just mm. simply because of, of the weight of, of the recommendations that are coming uh, for all surgical specialties, which have direct relevance to what we're trying to do. So um, it's been a really interesting time, and I'm really excited to see where it goes from here. Yeah. I have commented several times that I'm always amazed by the initiatives happening here and how collaborative a national healthcare system can be and you actually can work in these different groups and you know that oh, we were talking about Nila and Floella and, and Epoch and all those and how that works together and then this with the tripom I think that's unique and wonderful and wish <laughs> wish we'd have something like that in the U.S. to be able to do that um, well actually ladies I think we're 
going to be pressed for time. We need to get back into the next session. It was a nice little quick, uh, quick session here. But thank you so much for sitting down with us. Top Bed Talk. Mick Majerison here. On August the 11th, 12th and 13th, the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists will be holding their annual congress. Top Med Talk will be coming to you with live updates from the meeting as it happens. We will be interviewing thought leaders, academics and prominent practitioners for three days of discussion and debate. The opioid crisis, enhanced recovery, innovations in anaesthesia and much, much more. Guests will include the president of the AA&A, Gary Bridges, Lynn Reed, and Lorraine Jordan, to name but a few. To get ahead of the curve, why not listen to some of last year's podcasts from the AA&A? Simply go to topmedtalk.com and type into the search engine AA&A. Pop that in and you will find our output from last year. In the meantime, of course, if you want to find out more, the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists are holding their annual congress August the 11th through till the 13th. Go to topmedtalk.com for more details. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe to Top Med Talk. And of course, you've joined us on social media. That's topmedtalk.com.